Good evening. Welcome to the National Institute of Advanced Studies. Uh, my name is Gopi Ratan Raj. I'm uh, a faculty member at the National Institute of Advanced Studies. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this public lecture jointly organized by NIAS and the Hindu Center for Public Policy. I now invite Mr. V.S. Samadhan of the Hindu Center to give the welcome address. Honorable Speaker of the Day, the Honorable Jairam Ramesh, uh, Dr. Baldev Raj, um, ladies and gentlemen, friends from the press, it is my honor and privilege to extend to you on behalf of the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy and NIAS to a very nice and informative evening on, the, on a lecture by um, Mr. Jairam Ramesh on climate change, a matter which is of pressing importance. Um, a few words about the Hindu Center. This is our first event in uh, Bangalore, and we thank Nias very much for playing host to us, helping us with that. Uh, we were founded on the 31st of January 1913, inaugurated by the President of India. It is an independent, not-for-profit not uh, division of the Hindu group of uh, the Kasturi and Sons, which publishes the Hindu and group publications. Uh, we have three main streams of activity, research, essentially in long-form research, on matters of contemporary importance is our primary activity. We also hold public interactions like this uh, with uh, distinguished speakers. We've had a national consultation on the formation of Telangana. We've had meetings on uh, opinion polls, and it is our plan to go out to other cities as well and uh, take, our, uh, take our reach into areas which have which need such uh, inter interface and interaction. Uh, we, we basically deal in entirely with issues to do with domestic uh, politics and public policy making. We have, a, we have an active presence on the web. We are available at thehinducenter.com. Uh, I'd request you to find your time to visit us online and do give us your feedback. Uh, may I invite uh, Mr. Jairam Ramesh and Dr. Baldev Raj, please, to take the floor, and the floor is yours. Good evening to all of you. Thank you, Mr. V.S. Uh, Sambandan, to join with NIAS to have a common program. I sincerely wish that in future we'd have more programs together in Bangalore, Chennai, and maybe any other part of the country or the world. There's a lot of commonality between our pursuits, so NIAS greatly welcomes your joining with us. Good beginning is a great thing, and I think our collaboration is starting with Mr. Jairam Ramesh. So it is a very good uh, happening, which shall foster many, many good things to happen. I'm very thankful to all of you for having come this evening to listen to Jairam Ramesh. Nyas or Hindu doesn't have to do anything to get the audience when Mr. Jairam Ramesh is speaking. You say Mr. Jairam Ramesh is speaking, the audience would come. So we didn't do much to get you here, but thank you very much for your interest. It's also good coincidence that this time we are doing a course for the young leaders, I may not call it as a course, exposure to the young leaders on energy, sustainability, and management. And this talk very well fits into that. So about 27 participants who are taking part in this course, it's a wonderful opportunity to listen to a perspective from Mr. Jairam Ramesh. You would agree with me, these are the issues on which it's very difficult to speak. They are beyond multi and interdisciplinary. The terminologies which are very often used by policymakers, scientists, technologists, or economists. Finding answers amidst the complexity of the things to make it simple to implement and management requires a mind and the experience which a few have through
through their experiences and through their rigor. So I am very happy that Mr. Jairam Ramesh has accepted this invitation from the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy and National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore, to give a talk. Mr. Jairam Ramesh is really difficult to capture in few sentences and by data. You have seen him in public life. His elegance, his eloquence, his deep thought, his convictions, his capacity to take the issues head on is known to all of us. However, when you are working in a country like India, where the problems are more, we challenge them, but still the residual problems remain large. We are not able to address those issues. We need from time to time to listen to the persons of eminence and commitment and great love for this country who can enlighten us. Ms. Jairam Ramesh, to my mind, is one with whom you can agree, you can disagree with dignity, and you can agree to continue to discuss at a later stage if you are able to neither agree nor disagree. So Mr. Jairam Ramesh, among us, us this evening, is going to trigger us some thoughts. And fortunately, we have enough time to discuss and really come up with something which we can call that we had a meeting on 10th November 2014, and we have come up something which we are ready to rigorously follow and adopt as we go on. Mr. Jairam Ramesh is the member of the Rajya Sabha, the upper house of India's parliament, representing the state of Andhra Pradesh, and senior visiting fellow at the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy. A former union minister, Jairam Ramesh has held several portfolios in the union government, including rural development, drinking water and sanitation, environment and forests, commerce and power, and commerce. Before taking up public office, he has been a techni technocrat carrying out a number of administrative assignments. He was the advisor to the finance minister, 1996-98, to 98, officer on special duty to the deputy chairman of the planning commission, 1991-94, to 94, to the prime minister, June to September 1991, and in the Planning Commission 86 to 89. He has also been an additional economic advisor in the Ministry of Industry 85-86, and a consultant in the advisory board on energy, cabinet secretariat, etc. So you see, over more than 30 years, he has occupied many positions which has changed the country or influenced the country. He is a BTEC graduate in mechanical engineering from IIT Mumbai in 1975, and he did his MS in public policy from Carnegie Mellon University, and attended a graduate program in technology policy from MIT USA. He has written regular columns in the Telegraph, the Times of India, Business Standard, India Today, and has also been a part of TV shows on business and current affairs in many, many channels. He has also written many articles for the Hindu. Some of his published works include Indo-U.S. Relations in 2000, Globalizing India 2003, and Making Sense of Chindia 2005. Besides, he has a few forthcoming publications, notable among them being Ecology, Democracy and Growth, India's Maoist Challenge, and, and a New Deal for Land Acquisition. His major achievements include the design and implementation of special development strategies for nine most affected states in India. He has played a key role in the design of legislation, extremely important, which has been a paradigm change for India, is the Right to Information Act in 2005. He has also been instrumental in making major contribution to the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act 2006, the Forest Rights Act 2006, the National Food Security Act 2013, and the Land Acquisition Act 2013. He also played a crucial role in placing environmental, sustainable development, and forest conservation issues on the national agenda. Internationally, he has played a key leadership role in the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, 
2009-10 and climate change summits in Copenhagen 2009 and Cancun 2010, which was acknowledged by world leaders such as U.S. President Barack Obama and German Chancellor Angela Merkel. With a great pleasure, we are all eager to listen to you and look forward to listen to you. Mr. Jaram Ramesh. Thank you, Dr. Baldev Raj. One of the advantages of being a minister is that you can speak extempore. And one of the disadvantages of being an ex-minister coming to an academic institution is that you have to appear scholarly and therefore have a written text. And therefore, actually the Hindu center has accomplished something which very few institutions have been able to do, is to get me to actually write a speech. I've spent a whole lifetime writing speeches for others, but this is one of those occasions in which I've actually had to write a speech for myself. Uh, so I have a written text, and the written text will be on the website very soon. Uh, and those of you who are interested in what I have to say uh, in a much deeper footing can suddenly go to the Hindu Center website and have a look at the speech. Uh, this is the second in a series of public lectures that I'm delivering in different parts of the country on climate change under the aegis of the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy. The first was in Chennai two weeks back. And in that talk, I focused on why India must take bold and proactive intellectual and political leadership on global climate change negotiations and why our traditional defensive stance has simply not been in the enlightened self-interest. My main arguments were three. One, that there is no other country like India which faces multiple vulnerabilities, both current and future, to the vagaries of climate change. Two, that the sheer demographics of India which will add another 400 million people to its current population of 1.24 billion and become the world's most populous country by the middle of the century calls for sustainable development being made an overriding imperative. And three, environmental issues in India have already begun to acquire critical public health dimensions. These three arguments, I believe, necessitate a change in our mindsets towards doing something constructive, both domestically and internationally, on what is surely the epochal issue of our times, namely global warming and its local impacts. This evening, I will focus on the energy sector and look at what our options are. Climate change has added a whole new context to our energy policy. When I first started out in government in the early 80s and carried out one of the early analysis of future energy demand and supply in the Advisory Board on Energy, the word environment or climate did not figure even once in the 300-page report that had been prepared. I now plead guilty. The situation has changed dramatically since then. Over half of India's greenhouse gas emissions expressed in carbon dioxide equivalent terms is from electricity generation alone. And as coal-based generating capacity increases rapidly as it is expected to, this share will only go up. More coal-based power generating capacity is what might be called a double whammy. Coal-based power plants emit carbon dioxide, which is the most preponderant carbon greenhouse gas. In the Indian context, because of high ash content, the combustion of one ton of coal will result in an emission of around 1.5 tons of carbon dioxide. More than this, much of the new coal reserves and mines are in rich forest areas in states like Jharkhand, Odisha, and Chhattisgarh. An analysis which was carried out when I was Minister for Environment and Forests 
of nine major coal fields of the country, this was carried out in 2010, revealed that anywhere between 30% and 45% of the coal blocks fall in what might be called no-go areas, that is, in areas of high forest cover. Their extraction will lead to considerable deforestation and thereby to a loss of valuable carbon sink. It is well known that forests absorb carbon dioxide and deforestation leads to global warming. And compensatory afforestation through plantations can never substitute, never comp compensate for loss of natural forests with their rich biodiversity. I have started with coal and it is but natural to do so since almost two thirds of our electricity generation comes from coal-based power plants. A figure, a proportion that according to current conventional wisdom is unlikely to change in the next two decades at least. We use something like 500 million tons of coal to generate electricity today. And current plans are to double this to about a billion tons by the end of this decade. India, incidentally, has the world's third largest reserves of coal, although, as I have mentioned earlier, these reserves have a high ash content, which bring down the heat that can be generated from the combustion of one ton of coal. I was a minister of state for power during April 2008 and February 2009. One of the far-reaching decisions taken then was for India to invest heavily in supercritical technology, which leads to a reduction of emissions of at least 5% over conventional power plants. Supercritical power plants operate at much higher temperatures and pressures. After 2017, that is at the end of the 12th five-year plan, my recommendation to the government then was that all new coal-based power plants should be based on supercritical technology, a recommendation that was accepted and that I am sure will continue under the present ruling dispensation as well. What else can be done? Carbon capture and sequestration, or CCS as it is called, has been talked about. Norway has commissioned the world's first such facility with the carbon dioxide being injected into oil reservoirs to enhance recovery. Recently, Canada announced the launch of the world's first commercial scale CCS power plant with a generating capacity of 110 megawatts. Theoretically, carbon dioxide from the flue gases can be captured and used in this manner or combined with ammonia to manufacture urea. But what appears attractive on paper may not be feasible in practice. And truth be told, CCS is still far, far away off. IGCC is another technology that might hold promise. IGCC stands for integrated gasification in combined cycle, where the efficiency can go up to 45% and more. Since coal is converted into gas, carbon dioxide emissions from the power plant are also eliminated. Dr. R. Chidambaram, the then principal scientific advisor to the union cabinet and I, had launched India's first IGCC facility in Vijayawada six years ago to be put up by BHEL, but sadly, that facility has made no progress whatsoever. Yet another example of how India does not lack in knowledge, but fails in translating that knowledge into commercial technologies. I still believe that IGCC is an area where India can build a strategic advantage. I want to raise two other pressing environmental issues 
arising from the large-scale use of coal. New emission concerns are emerging. India is already the world's second largest emitter of sulfur dioxide. The main reason for this has been the phenomenal expansion in coal-fired electricity generating capacity, an expansion that, as I have explained, will continue for quite some time. Given the fact that sulfur dioxide stays long in the atmosphere and can be transported over long distances, it is urgent that concentration standards, from a health perspective at least, be developed and enforced. True, we have progressive ambient air quality standards that were promulgated four years back and steps have been taken to clean up cities, for instance by reducing the sulfur content of diesel and by the use of natural gas in public transportation. But the hot spots are clearly elsewhere and these are not being captured in ground-based monitoring systems that are in place. In a recent publication of the American Chemical Society, scientists at the Argonne National Laboratory and NASA have used data collected from satellite-based remote sensing instruments to assess the situation. The conclusion is that sulfur dioxide emissions have increased by 71% between 2005 and 2012 and the increment was the highest in Chhattisgarh, Gujarat, and Odisha. The res researchers have also used satellite-based measurement data to establish that overall nitrogen oxide chemistry over Indian power plants has changed significantly in recent years. Here again, unfortunately, as in the case of sulfur dioxide, there are no concentration standards for emissions of nitrogen oxides from coal-based power plants. A second new concern relates to mercury. Singaroli in Sonbhadra district of Uttar Pradesh is a huge private and public sector industrial and power generating cluster. Some estimates are that around 17% of India's power plant mercury emissions are from Singaroli cluster alone. Both official and non-official studies of the local population have revealed high mean mercury blood levels and mercury levels in hair that have resulted in highly adverse health conditions for the local population, particularly in terms of respiratory disorders. India has just joined the Minamata Convention on Mercury, named after that infamous Japanese city that since the 1950s has become synonymous with deadly mercury contamination and poisoning. Given their tremendous expansion, inevitable over the next decade at least, it is imperative that like the United States and China, India now establish and enforce mercury emission standards from coal-based power plants and for coal mining as well. The Minamata Convention gives India five years to control and where feasible to reduce emissions from new power plants and 10 years to do so from existing power plants. But we need not wait that long. I now want to turn to nuclear power, a subject with which Dr. Baldev Raj has been associated with for all his working life. Nuclear power, from the point of view of climate policy, is ideal because atomic power plants emit no carbon dioxide that is responsible for global warming or sulfur dioxide that has aggravated human health. Unfortunately, environmentalists who want clean energy are 99.99% against nuclear energy. And this is why I have described often that nuclear is a red rag to the green bull. But as I will explain, if India ignores nuclear power, we might as well, having, we might as well forget having a climate-sensitive 
energy policy. Our performance on the nuclear power front has been, to put it very mildly, disappointing. No doubt, sanctions imposed after the first Pokhran explosion of May 1974 severely handicapped the expansion of our nuclear power program. Even so, the fact remains that 45 years after the first nuclear power plant at Tarapur became operational, nuclear power still accounts for just 3.5% of our electricity supply. As of now, the total installed capacity of nuclear power is just about 4,780 megawatts and another 4,800 megawatts of capacity that includes the 2,000 megawatt plants at Kurunkulam that are in an advanced stage of commissioning is under various stages of construction. Other than this, almost everything else is on paper. For instance, the Jaitapur nuclear power plant that would host 9,600 megawatts of capacity with French technology got environmental clearance four years back. And all the environmentalist friends who otherwise hailed me for all that I did in the ministry criticized me roundly for giving environmental clearance for the Jaitapur nuclear power plant, something which I have yet to live down. But the Jaitapur nu nuclear power park is nowhere in sight. The landmark 2005 Indo-US nuclear agreement has not much to show for itself, except that India has been able to get natural uranium from other countries to increase the capacity factor from existing nuclear power plants. Five years ago, the capacity factor was an abysmal 50%, but it, today it is now up to 83%, and that is almost entirely because of the natural uranium we have been able to get from countries like France and Kazakhstan after the Indo-US nuclear agreement. But something to gladden the hearts of Dr. Baldevraj and Dr. Prabhat Kumar, who are sitting here, there is one extraordinary development in this depressing scenario of nuclear power. And this has to do with the fact that India is becoming the second country in the world to have a commercial scale fast breeder reactor program running on a mix of plutonium and uranium oxides. India's 500 megawatt prototype fast breeder reactor called the PFBR, started 11 years ago at Kalpakam near Chennai, is almost 97% complete and is likely to become fully operational by this time next year. Russia is the only other country to have operating fast breeder reactors. It has two reactors with a total capacity of about 1,200 megawatts. France used to have a 250 megawatt fast breeder, which it operated smoothly for almost 30 years and then decommissioned it. A second 1200 megawatt fast breeder reactor was commissioned in 1985, but was then shut down following an accident involving leakage of molten sodium that is used as a coolant in the reactor. The UK and Japan both shut down their commercial scale fast breeders in the 1990s. India's logic for the fast breeder program is fundamental and impeccable. Without a fast breeder program that uses spent fuel from natural uranium reactors, India will not be able to use its vast th reserves of thorium. Thorium remains the ultimate holy grail of India's energy policy. Thorium, unlike uranium, is not a fissile material. It cannot produce electricity by itself. It is what physicists call a fertile material that can get converted into a fissile material like uranium-233. Estimates vary quite widely, but it is generally accepted. Actually, I had to brush up 
a lot of my physics while preparing this lecture, you know. So not only did I had to write this lecture, but I had to remember the nuclear physics that I had learned almost 40 years ago. Estimates vary widely, but it is generally accepted that India could well have 25% of the world's thorium reserves. The fast breeder route is the only way our abundant reserves of thorium can be used to produce electricity. The other benefit of a fast breeder, which is what my environmentalist friends must recognize, the other benefit of a fast breeder is that by recycling the spent fuel, most of the long-lived radioactive waste is eliminated. Current plans are to install another two 500 megawatt fast meter reactors at Kalpakam itself that will come on stream sometime towards the later part of the next decade in another two such reactors elsewhere in the country. India clearly is a world leader in this area. The atomic energy establishment's projections envisage a nuclear power generating capacity of some 63,000 megawatts by the year 2030. It is important to think big and bold, especially when we confront the challenges to move on to a low carbon growth path at the earliest. But in light of past performance and current realities, this target of 63,000 megawatts does appear to be ambitious and somewhat unrealistic. The Planning Commission's own low carbon energy strategy expert group had scaled it down to 40,000 megawatts, which itself is a formidable goal. At this level of capacity, by the year 2030, nuclear will account for 8% of electricity supply, up from the present 3.5% to 8% by the year 2030, roughly on par with solar and wind contributions. To achieve even this lower figure will call for urgent steps to address the companies of, to address the concerns of global companies on the unlimited liability imposed on them by the nuclear liability legislation passed by parliament and that came into force in November 2011. Having said this, I believe that it is perhaps time to revisit the assumptions related to the acquisition of imported reactors and have a much bolder strategy for the expansion of indigenous heavy water reactors themselves. India also needs to put in place a truly independent regulator along the lines proposed in the legislation introduced in parliament three years back. Such a regulator has to necessarily address public concerns on safety that have increased immeasurably in the post-Fukushima era and other risks associated with nuclear technology. Nuclear technology is clean but is not risk-free. We have to address the public concerns on risks. Earlier this year, India had agreed to have a peer review of its nuclear regulatory system under the auspices of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, and hopefully this review should commence in the next few months. This would be the first time, and I want to stress this, this would be the first time that such a formal review would be taking place and should help in generating greater public confidence in the plans of the atomic energy establishment. Friends, the Germans gave the word kindergarten to the world of education. The word kindergarten comes from German. To development economics, Germans gave the word Wirtschaftswunder, which is used to describe Germany's remarkable economic transformation immediately following World War II. Now, in the era 
of sustainable growth, another typically long German word is inviting global attention. And this is energy windy. This refers to the profound energy transition Germany is going through. For a country dubbed as the sick man of Europe at the beginning of this century, this achievement is truly remarkable. Today, something like 30%, note this figure, 30% of Germany's electricity supply, not capacity, 30% of Germany's electricity supply comes from solar and wind energy, and it is actually exporting power. For a country in which the sun is not visible eight months in a year, this is truly a miraculous achievement. The goal is to increase this contribution to 50% by the year 2030 and a staggering 80% by the year 2050. Smaller countries in Scandinavia have similar achievements and ambitions, but Germany is completely different because it is the world's preeminent industrial economy and has a population of slightly over 80 billion. The scale of what Germany has accomplished over the past decade and a half is what gives it wider relevance, especially to larger countries like India. Presently, without much sun, Germany has around 37,000 megawatts of installed solar energy capacity. In addition, it has another 29,000 megawatts of installed wind energy capacity. What has given renewables new momentum is the decision of Chancellor Angela Merkel to completely phase out Germany's present nuclear power generating capacity of about 12,000 megawatts by the year 2022. Germany is phasing out nuclear and phasing in renewables. It was a bold decision, given that when Fukushima happened, Germany was getting between a fifth and a quarter of its electricity supply from nuclear power plants. It is a complete decommissioning of such plants in eight years' time, coupled with an overriding emphasis on energy efficiency and renewable energy that gives energy windy a unique dimension. Meeting domestic and international environmental objectives has undoubtedly been Germany's primary motivation for this remarkable change. Legislation for promoting renewable energy was first enacted 14 years ago. It has undergone many changes subsequently, but the anchor remains the concept of a feed-in tariff that depends on the technology being used. Anybody, anybody, can invest in solar or wind power, sell power to the grid, and get a generous income that covers both investment and running costs, and that is guaranteed regardless of demand for 20 years. The grid operator has a legal obligation to connect the installation and an obligation to accept any electricity whenever it is produced. The net result of this is, today, there are close to five million small energy producers. In a population of 80 million, one in 16 virtually is generating electricity, accounting for almost half of the installed renewable energy capacity. The structure of electricity generation has been thoroughly shaken up and the four big private utilities have been consistently losing market share. So what Germany is doing is replicating the mobile phone revolution in electricity generation. What does this mean for India? Presently, wind energy capacity in India is close to 22,000 megawatts. And solar, with having the world's best solar radiation capacity, 
Solar capacity is a measly 2,650 megawatts as compared to nuclear, which I mentioned about 4,800 megawatts. Capacity-wise, wind and solar account for about 13% of our electricity generating capacity, although their contribution to electricity supply is much lower at about 6%. In April 2014, the Planning Commission's expert group on low carbon strategies for inclusive growth had released its final report that suggested that by 2030, the share of solar, wind, and biomass in electricity supply should be trebled to around 18% by the year 2030. Unfortunately, this report has yet to get the full public attention it warrants. The main difference with Germany, of course, is that in 2030, India's energy supply basket is projected to have an 8% contribution from nuclear power as well. In terms of capacity, wind energy is recommended to increase to 100,000 megawatts and solar to another 100,000 megawatts by the year 2030. These may look daunting goals at the moment, but these are eminently feasible, especially given the fact that India is the most favorably endowed country in relation to solar energy and certainly is amongst the most favorably endowed countries in relation to wind energy. The energy transition will have to be driven by innovations in technology, regulation, and financing. It will bring multiple benefits. It will increase energy security and also reduce emissions of carbon dioxide. But most importantly, in my view, it will have significant positive impacts on public health and also stimulate development of regions that have remained backward so far. The possibility of India acquiring strategic leadership in the green technology area, like I mentioned, the fast breeder area, globally in about a decade's time is also very real, provided it is linked with a strong indigenous research and development and engineering capability. New avenues for employment will accelerate. A very recent study has estimated that around 24,000 jobs have been created. 24,000 jobs have been created in the last three years when solar capacity has increased from 1,800 megawatts to 2,600 megawatts. In Germany, the renewable sector employs close to 400,000, that is 4 lakh people. And therefore, as capacity and supply contribution expands, green employment in India too will gain substantially. Brazil derives 80% of its electricity from hydel sources. And that is one reason why it accounts for less than 2% of world greenhouse gas emissions as compared to China's share of 29% and India's share of about 6%. Incidentally, the share of China has almost trebled in the last 20 years, while that of India has doubled. China's share might well stabilize, but India's share of global greenhouse gas emissions could well increase to at least 10% by the year 2025. Clearly, a large hydel share is very climate friendly. Recent, presently, about 20% of India's electricity supply comes from hydel sources. And we have exploited about 35% or so of our ultimate hydel potential. Incidentally, almost one third of India's hydel potential is in one state of Arunachal Pradesh alone. Can this increase significantly and relieve some of the pressure on us as far as the use of coal is concerned? 
hydro projects are non-polluting and non-CO2 emitting, but they pose formidable ecological challenges of their own, especially when they involve the construction of storage dams. Large-scale displacement of people becomes inevitable. There have been concerns of reservoir-induced seismicity, perhaps triggered by our experience in the 60s in Koina in Maharashtra. But experts whom I have spoken to, and I certainly am not one, have opined that these fears are exaggerated. In the context of a series of hydro projects planned in the same river basin, like Alakdanda, like Mandakini, like Siang, like Dibang, where you have a number of projects on the same river basin, issues relating to cumulative impact assessment and minimum ecological flows arise to which we have not paid adequate attention. And hence, the opposition to hydro projects in places like Uttarakhand and the Northeast. An excessively engineering approach to hydro projects has cost us dearly. And it is time that we adopt a whole new perspective if we are to build public confidence and stem the tide of public protests. So friends, what does this all add up to? It is clear that India is in an extraordinarily tight situation. We cannot escape dependence on coal for the foreseeable future, and the best we can do is to minimize its environmental costs. Clean coal is an oxymoron. It's a contradiction in terms. You can have cleaner coal. You can have more cleaner coal, but you can't have clean coal. So all we can plan for is cleaner coal and make it a reality. Make much cleaner coal, both in terms of mining and in terms of combustion, a reality. Our nuclear program requires new adrenaline. Heidel can certainly expand, but this must be done in a most sensitive manner a manner which sadly we have not demonstrated as yet in the past. We need radical new thinking, German style, on renewables, especially on solar energy. There are other aspects of our energy policy that also demand our attention, like the dissemination of improved cook stoves to deal with the issue of black carbon, which has profound public health implications as well, and the widespread use of biogas for, that is generated both from cattle dung as well as human waste. These aspects, however, are more social rather than technological in nature, and the barriers are more organizational than scientific, more to do with the three Ds of development, dissemination, and diffusion. The electricity sector is also some sort of a safety wall for us to argue in global forums against taking on any mitigation responsibilities on climate change. The fact that over 50 million Indian homes still don't have access, 50 million Indian homes out of 200 million Indian homes still don't have access to basic electricity facilities gives us a strong wicket to bat on, free from any worries to reduce emissions. In all global negotiations, all that the Indian minister has to do is to go and say, India is special, India is different, because one in our four Indian homes still don't have electricity, and therefore we have every right to pollute and every right to emit. And that has been India's traditional stance for the last 25 years. That window is closing, slowly, but definitely. And India will be called upon to make some major mitigation commitments for 2025 and 2030 to begin with. 
India must play a pivotal role in designing a new architecture for a global climate change agreement at Paris in December 2015. This would be in keeping with the civilization that has proclaimed Vasudeva Kutumbukam. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, for giving a very comprehensive and remarkable perspective. He has not minced any words. He has spoken whatever he has experienced and felt and piloted and is going to pilot in future. The, the presentation is open to discussions and clarifications. Yes, please. There first. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ramesh. Uh, your traditional forte in making things very clear, very lucid, uh, very informative presentation. But I have a critical comment and I hope you won't mind. See, it's a very, it's a very technical approach that you have presented. And this is fine if you are presenting to a government audience of policymakers to take stock of the scene and how to do. In an institution, academic one like this, and we are wondering Where is the conceptualization of the development problematic, if one may put it that way? No matter what you do in these terms, and it should be done, I have no quarrel with what you're saying, countries like ours are in a jam. You know that better than most of us, I'm sure. You have rising aspirations, material aspirations of the people, very legitimate, living in conditions that we know in our country. On the one hand, you have the environment, the climate change problem becoming a binding constraint, setting limits to development in the midst of this energy poverty in our country. And I'm not talking of the other poverty, because that can be provided for real needs, basic needs. But energy poverty is a matter of... So on the one hand, you have this. On the other hand, you have the demonstration effect in this digital age, where you see every day sitting in and out uh, lug limitless luxury uh, abroad on your screens. So that has impact. So caught between these two, we have to think of what constitutes development. And there is complete lack of conceptual clarity as to what should constitute. For example, there is so much talk of conspicuous consumption. But what constitutes conspicuous consumption from, for the, from the point of view of policy? Where can it be curbed, if at all? So these are issues that don't seem to attract any attention at all. And that is why it is disappointing. It's not you personally, your presentation is very good, but it's the discourse as a whole, in fact. No, how, so how do we see ourselves? Oh, thank you, and Ambassador. we are all problems in that. Right. You see, so we have to. So there are some difficult questions, and we would look forward to people who have been in your position, who have had the opportunity to take stock, to give a lead in that direction. See, the <clears throat> I take as given that consumption standards have to increase. I don't think that we are going to win the debate on climate change or clean energy or environment if you say that put physical limits to consumption, people's aspirations for a better quality of life, an improved standard of living, uh, more consumerism, so to speak, uh, is natural. Now, the challenge for us really is the numbers, is not numbers. The numbers that we are talking about, 1.24 billion, going to be 1.7 billion, if each Indian has a consumption standard of an American, uh, you know, well, you know, um, one of Gandhiji's most famous quotations, in fact, many famous quotations of Gandhiji have never been said by Mahatma Gandhi, but there's one quotation with which he's often associated with, which is very true, which is very quoted over and over again, that the world has enough for everybody's need, but not enough for everybody's greed. He never said it, but actually, we like to think he said it. It's a, it's a very true thing. <laughs> Fact is that consumption standards 
India cannot say, no government has the courage to say that we are not going to sell more than 2 million cars every year. This much and no more. In fact, if car sales dip in one month, hmm. all the pink newspapers go into mourning. All the TV channels have public debates. Arnab Goswami gets into an apoplectic fit. <laughs> you know, it doesn't take much to get him into a fit, but this is, you know, one of those things that gets him into a fit. So, this consumption, India's challenge is to recognize the inevitability of more people wanting refrigerators, more people wanting air conditioners, more people wanting cars, more people wanting electricity. How do you do it in a manner that fulfills your environmental objective? How do you do it in a manner that meets your climate change obligations? Because clearly, clearly, the free ride is over. Let's be very clear. The free ride is over. And the free ride is over not because the world is saying so. In fact, my, for the last five years, I've been saying that on climate change, the free ride is over because of domestic reality. Already monsoon behavior is becoming erratic. Our coastline, 7,000 kilometer long coastline, sea levels have increased. Himalayan glaciers are retreating. Forests are being depleted. So domestically and increasingly environment is having a public health impact. So domestically, India is being called upon to demonstrate a different model. Now I, I share your frustration because what we are seeing in India is a replication of the American model, the Chinese model, the Brazilian model, which is grow now, pay later. You grow for 20 years, and then we'll worry about paying the environment and climate change cost 20 years from now. That is no longer a feasible option for us. So can India do things differently? I believe it can. There is no reason why Germany should be a world leader in solar energy. That is a legitimate position for India. Why have we allowed the Germans to be the world leaders? There is no reason why India should not be a world leader in nuclear energy. Why at the end of 45 years, wind capacity is more than nuclear capacity in India? So I think our problems, we like to blame the world. Our problems are internal to us. And we have to recognize, on the one hand, growing urbanization, growing consumption, and on the other hand, the need for making that urbanization and consumption more climate friendly. And I think we can do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, please. Sorry, I can't hear you. But I'm surprised you have a question. You came half an hour late to my lecture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, three moments back, uh, sure, with the help of Karnataka uh, uh, Federation of uh, Commerce and Industry, the solar energy, uh, uh, yeah, with the help of uh, our uh, minister. So during that time, I came to know about solar energy. So when I came <laughs> in the middle, also I can able to uh, grab some point from. You. Now I'd like to ask about uh, uh, the India's promotion policies of the trade, in India, related. What Solar energy trade solar promotion solar. policies to reach the level of the World Trade Organization, whether India is making any effort regarding? Well, as I explained to you right now, our solar capacity is about a bare 2,650 megawatts. And the solar mission, the national solar mission that has been announced, uh, is to take this to 20,000 megawatts by the year 2020. And a hundred thousand megawatts by the year 2030. We have to be very bold and think completely differently in terms of solar energy. We've got to think in terms of rooftops. Uh, we have to think in terms of decentralized grids. This morning I was talking to a solar company in Bangalore. Some of you may have heard of this company. The, the promoter got the Maxesse Award recently, Selco. Uh, and uh, they are thinking now of s mini grids based on solar energy uh, where you're generating the power and distributing the power, solar power. So you have to think very, very boldly in, in these matters. Uh, and 
even today i would say that when you look at all the hidden costs of fossil fuels hidden costs the when you compare fossil fuel cost and solar cost you're comparing apples and oranges because the solar cost is unsubsidized and the fossil fuel cost is highly subsidized and it does not include the environmental cost of coal mining uh, or coal pollution if you take the full cost i would say today solar is competitive maybe it's 10% more expensive 15% more expensive but in the long term it will come out much cheaper it it calls for you know uh, it calls for a uh, it's easy to change mindsets but it's damn difficult to change set minds you know and our mind is set that coal will have more coal <laughs> india wind energy biomass energy and certainly and i'll make this uh, it will be very controversial certainly nuclear i think we must be much bolder on nuclear than we have been on the in the past Yes, please. Question, uh, sir. First of all, thanking you for putting up some quantitative figures instead of speaking some uh, qualitative aspects, uh, sir. Some couple of cascaded cascaded questions. First of all, speaking about the thorium that you mentioned that out of the uh, uh, world's total uh, availability of the thorium, we have 25 more than 25 percent of the resources. So, is it only fast bitter reactor that can uh, that uh, that can be useful to convert the thorium, which is a fertile, into the fissile? That is the first question. second question is that uh, you uh, this is a third way of nuclear energy that we have we have so far in, uh, installed only the nuclear fission plant it based on the fission we have the another technology called cold fusion which uh, people are uh, uh, recently coming up with although some of the physicists uh, are not believing on on, uh, on this technology but china has uh, set up this plant to come come up with this idea of the nuclear fusion so what is your front on this sir what is uh, your comment on uh, implementing on this technology and investing r&d investment in terms of uh, development of this cold fusion technology cold fusion yes sir cold fusion no no see we should uh, we should not fall prey to quackery in this area okay cold fusion in my view is quackery you know uh, i'm sorry to say this you are a better expert uh, all the nuclear experts are here but uh, i don't think any scientist takes cold fusion seriously uh, i know i get a lot i get a lot of emails saying that cold fusion is the answer to india's problems but i i have yet to meet a serious scientist in india or abroad who believes that cold fusion uh, is uh, something that can be taken seriously on a commercial scale am i right doctor no. there has been significant work in the cold fusion some people are saying the pilot plant but the fact is that we take it as a science when it can be repeated in different places by different scientists based on same science cold fusion has not come to that stage yet so any investment are looking to it for energy generation would not be appropriate at this stage it is open to discussion that what are divergences and we can't leave it out we have to keep a watch because some people have got significant heat release out of cold fusion i'd like to follow up on the development question because you alluded to a lot of points of uh, energy for whom and from where and from whom really and i'd like just wanted to see if you could elaborate more on that because it seems from the planning perspective some of it is the last mile this 25% of households that don't have electricity for which decentralized things like solar might be more useful because that also you, it solves the land tenure problem more easily but as we know for instance the anecdotal reports coming out of wind seem to suggest that there's a huge tenure problem in where who's capturing the wind installations where is this going what what happens similarly with nuclear i think a lot of this is if you are where are you getting the power for is it for more industry is it for more consumption is it to solve your last mile for the household and different kinds of power satisfy different kinds of those with different land tenure implications of of who costs who pays for whose benefits see my advice to you is don't get too philosophical because if you if you ask all these questions the ultimate answer is you won't do anything every option that you exercise has some advantage some disadvantage i know there are a lot of people who are against wind energy on various considerations you know land intensive it affects the landscape um, people are against solar energy because again for 1 megawatt of solar you need 6 acres of land where is the land available 
So there are all sorts of problems with each of the options. But the question is that you need energy. You need energy for cooking. You need energy for lighting. You need energy for transportation. You need energy for industrial processes. Where is this energy going to come from? I have not read or anything. I've been in this business for three decades. There is no alternative to electricity. Now, if you want to go back to the way we lived 300 years ago or 400 years ago, uh, that's one option. You know? But I don't think anybody is advocating that option. I think everybody is saying that every Indian is entitled to minimum standard of living and a standard of living is correlated with electricity supply. But where is that electricity going to come from? That's the real issue. Now, the choices that you make are very important. Should we have more public transport? Why are we under-investing in public transport? That's a legitimate question. How many people does a metro benefit? Uh, metro is also highly subsidized, by the way. We don't we never look at the subsidy element in the metros. But it's public transport. It, to the extent that it alleviates the pressure on private transport, it's a net societal benefit. How are we urbanizing? Are we urbanizing horizontally or are we urbanizing vertically? If we urbanize horizontally, like the Americans have, we have a recipe for disaster on our hands. Land and energy intensive. So we have India, because of the demographics, has to urbanize vertically. We have to go vertical. We can't go horizontal. So these are choices we make. But the basic point remains that India's biggest challenge today is to expand the supply of energy. We can certainly manage demand better. We can certainly manage demand better, but I don't think that anybody can legitimately say, consume less, use less power, use less transport, cook less, eat less. <laughs> You know, I don't think those options are not, those are philosophical options. The real world options are consume more. So my challenge is that if that is a reality, how do you meet that demand in environmentally the best manner possible? So in the negotiations, the India's argument for per capita emission, don't you think it is an argument where the rich is hiding behind the poor? And my second question is, uh, in the mitigation commitments, who is going to monitor in the absence of world institutions like world government, if America can walk out of Kuwait or Protocol, if India would meet the commitment or China would meet the commitment, who is going to uh, you know, sort of monitor that and implement that? And the third question is, in all your experiences... Why don't you just take one question? Because each of these questions is a one-hour answer. <laughs> so let's take the per capita thing, but that's very important. Well, India's traditional stance in global climate change negotiations is India is different. Why is India different? Because the denominator is very big. You know, so big deal. Why is the denominator very big? It's because of our own reproductive profligacy, no? 1.24 billion increasing by 12 million every year. Are we blaming the Americans for this? Whom do we have to? If that all blame has to be with ourselves. So per capita is not an argument. Per capita is a no-brainer. Because per capita consumption, when Indra Nui comes to India and she meets the Prime Minister, what does Indra Nui tell the Prime Minister? Per capita consumption of soft drinks is the lowest in India. Has to be. <laughs> We're dividing by 1.24 billion, increasing by 12 million every year. Per capita consumption of steel, lowest in India. So per capita emissions of carbon dioxide has to be the lowest in India. Because the denominator is the biggest. And we are, we are one country, most countries, denominator is going down. India is one country where denominator is not increasing. Denominator is galloping. <laughs> In the next 20, 30 years, denominator is not going to be 1.25 billion. Denominator will be 1.7 billion. So this per capita is a nice parda behind which we can hide and say we are different. Per capita is very, very low, so we can do what we want. That argument, nobody buys except us ourselves. Nobody buys that argument because 
in the totality, as I explained in my lecture, and you please read my written text, today India is already contributing 6% in absolute terms. And that 6% is not as big as China, 29%, not big as America, 15%, but still big. And that 6% will grow to about 10% by the year 2025. So it's big. It's not a small sum. And the next argument on per capita is, now if you are saying that don't do anything for India because our per capita is low, then I can pose the counter question and say, what about consumption within India? There are 200 million people in India whose consumption standards are like the Russian consumption standards. So those that 200 million people have consumption stand, emission standards on par with what the Russians are emitting. So people are asking this question, what about internal consumption? So let us not raise this question because we are very vulnerable. So this per capita thing is not a negotiating tactic. The per capita is an arithmetical derivation. And it should be obvious to anybody that per capita is low in India. That is why the argument should not be our per capita is low. The argument should be that our development needs are still to be met. Our electricity requirements have still to grow. And while India cannot reduce its absolute level of emissions, absolute level of emissions, India can certainly reduce relative emission cuts. So emission intensity can come down. Emission per unit of GDP can come down. But absolute levels of emissions for the next 10 to 15 years will, is bound to increase. You see the difference between absolute and relative. One is in terms of tons per CO2. The other one is tons per CO2 divided by dollar of GDP. So ton of CO2 divided by dollar of GDP should come down. But ton of CO2 will go up for the next 10 to 15 years. You have the question there. They are there with the stripes. Yes, please. Very good evening, sir. Uh, similar to what you advocated in your lecture in Chennai about uh, India conforming to Montreal Protocol and finding a way of transition from hydrofluorocarbons to directly the better alternatives. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You just sorry. say it slowly. What's the question? Uh, uh, something that you already advocated in your Chennai lecture that India transiting from uh, uh, hydrofluorocarbons, taking the route via hydrofluorocarbons and then finding a better alternative. Rather than that, it directly finds an alternative to the hydrofluorocarbons. Similar to that, um, taking a learning, uh, a leaf out of the Germany's uh, um, uh, experience of what they have done there with the solar energy, why do we need, uh, why, uh, do you think that, uh, do we even need to take the same route that we also need to go via the nuclear energy? Why can't we directly go from coal directly to the solar and the wind energy? And uh, I agree with you. I don't yeah. disagree with yeah, you. Yeah, let me complete we the don't have to repeat. We don't have to repeat the routes that other countries have adopted. You can yeah. leapfrog. And the issue of HFC that you have raised is a very important issue. Because 25 years ago, today everybody is worried about climate change. But 20 years ago, the entire world was worried about ozone depletion. Remember? There was depletion of the ozone layer. was the big environmental concern. And what did the world community do? It replaced CFC by HFC. But this HFC, which saved the ozone layer, is a global warming potential much higher than CO2. So we substituted a savior of ozone by a emission which is adding to global warming. So now we have to deal with the HFC issue. So my argument was instead of going HCFC, HFC, non-HFC, leapfrog and go into the non-HFC route directly. One of the advantages of being a latecomer is you can take these big steps and in solar, wind, nuclear, we can take these big steps. Okay. Uh, please, please limit your question to one only here because I have a limitation of time here. Uh, hello, sir. Um, we as a common man, 
doing nine to seven, eight jobs, six days a week. How can we contribute positively to all this government's uh, frame of climate change and all that? Well, if, if you were a German, you would be an energy producer. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> there will be a time when your house will be a rooftop, you will generate power, you will feed that power into that grid, uh, and you will be an energy producer. A day will come. A day will come when India will have rooftop power. I'm sure that day will come. But in the meanwhile, what can an average individual citizen do to reduce the carbon footprint? That is the question. The first thing is don't eat beef. Okay? <laughs> That's a, the biggest contributor to global warming is methane. And methane comes from large areas devoted to cattle, managing cattle. So I have often said this and my Western friends are not very happy. But a citizen, as a citizen, you stop eating beef, you reduce your carbon footprint. That's number one. Number two, you can certainly be much more efficient in the use of lighting. Your LED today, the replacement, are you, in your house do you have CFL or LED? You have CFL. Go home and throw out that CFL <laughs> and replace it with an LED, you would have reduced your carbon footprint. <laughs> oh, I see somebody raising his hand and saying, no, no. <laughs> I'm sure LED has its own problems. But if you are... If you are <laughs> sorry? No, no. LED yeah, yeah. is, from a climate change point of view, any day superior to CFL. This is scientifically incontrovertible. Although in this country, for every solution, we can find 10 problems. Okay? I'm sure there's some problem with LED. But you ask me this question, what you can do immediately? Number two. Number three. If you have a choice between private transport and public transport, exercise the public transport option. Because your carbon footprint will be lower. I mean, these are simple steps that individuals do. And the cumulative sigma of all these steps is a lower carbon footprint for the country. After all, the carbon footprint of the country is the summation of the carbon footprint of the individuals who make up the country. So individual choices in cooking, individual choices in lighting, individual choices in transportation, very, very important. India can make denominator as a multiplier. <laughs> so that can be a great... It's a good one, very yeah. good one. Thanks for the impressive presentation. I have a question with regards to the German model which you talked about. Now, Germany is uh, a leading player in European Union uh, in terms of the climate change diplomacy. Now, when European Union is negotiating in international forums, we are facing three uh, agendas. One is the binding targets, now which you have addressed that India cannot keep on saying that, look, we are a developing country, we are a latecomer. And the second one, as you are aware, that Germany's performance is not impressive across the board in terms of the vehicular uh, emissions for the SUVs. And also a few years earlier, there was a study that the thermal power plants, the coal-based power plants, are emitting higher levels of greenhouse emissions. So although the total consumption has come down in terms of the fossil fuel-based uh, power generation. And so they would be trying to hawk their technologies, which happens even at the regional forum with the delegations and all that. And the third one is they're talking about this comprehensive sustainability, you know, this NCRT programs. Now, how does India negotiate with its very brilliant technocratic talent with Euro European Union on an equal footing without getting overwhelmed by their climate change diplomacy? No, no, my, see, my point is, don't do this to negotiate. Do it because it's in your own interest. Don't do it that you're doing a favor to the world. You do it because you're doing a favor to your own people. Isn't clean energy a fundamental right of every Indian citizen? Why should Indian, every, every Indian citizen suffer from the right to pollute? Why should we put more sulfur dioxide into the air? Why should we put more carbon dioxide into the air? So I would delink what I do domestically 
from what I negotiate internationally. Okay? This is a very important point you have raised. And my position consistently has been and continues to be India must delink domestic action from negotiating position. We must do what we have to do because it is in our interest. Solar energy is a cleaner form of energy. We must do it because our citizens have a right to clean energy. So I am not bothered really frankly what the Europeans do or don't do. You know, 30 years ago, it's very sad, I have to say this, Dr. Gururaja is sitting here, uh, he was involved in this. 30 years ago, India was a world leader in solar energy. Am I right, Dr. Gururaja? 30 years ago, we were one of the world, probably the world, the leader. And today we are buying technology from the Chinese. It's amazing. I mean, we had, we had a program called NASPED. Am I right? You were running NASPED, National Photovoltaic Demonstration Program. We had a public sector company called CEL, Central Electronics, producing wafers. Now, 30 years ago, this was, you know, where India was. And today, we are arguing about, you know, where to get solar panels from, you know, we're getting it from China, we're getting it from Germany. My point is, 10 years from now, India can be the world supplier of solar systems. India can be the world's supplier of fast beta reactors. India can be the world's supplier of wind turbines. Why not? Why should we always see ourselves as recipients of technology? Unfortunately, for the last 20 years, this entire climate change debate has been predicated on the assumption that India is going to be a perennial buyer of technology. We should be selling technology to the others. Yeah, please. Yes, please. Uh, hello. Thanks for a very in informative presentation, sir. I, I just, uh, I'm wondering though whether we're dancing around the elephant in the room, which is that mitigation doesn't really look like it's going to work in the end. I, you, you might disagree with this, but uh, I, more and more experts point out that no country has ever reduced its emissions. Perhaps no country ever will. And what we should be focusing on is You mean adaptation. absolute levels of emissions? Yeah, and that, and that the eventual climate change scenario will come about irrespective of what negotiations we... No, no, we but that's... No, factually, factually, that's not true. Factually, there are countries who have reduced their absolute level of emissions. The European countries have reduced their absolute level of emissions. Germany, Denmark, Sweden, UK. Of course, different countries have... Uh, reduce their emissions through different ways. Some countries have reduced emissions by using more natural gas. Some countries have reduced emissions by using more solar energy. Some countries like Greece have reduced energy by bringing economic growth down to zero. <laughs> so if you don't have economic growth, you don't have emissions. That's also an option, which many of our people in this country would love, you know. Don't have growth, don't have options. So, uh, but factually, there are countries in the world which have actually reduced their emissions. So it's possible to reduce emissions. Well, uh, perhaps, in, in, perhaps in the study I was looking at, the EU was taken as a group or something like that. But, the, but my real question is... But the EU's adaptation? objective is to reduce absolute levels of emissions. They have said that they will reduce their absolute levels of emissions. Yeah. So EU is an example of an absolute cut, you know. They're, they're now, India cannot reduce its absolute levels. In the next, I mean, even I would say the next 10 years, uh, till 2030, our absolute levels will not come down. But we can, if our, if our growth rate was like this, business as usual, we can certainly have a growth rate like this. Business unusual, you know. So business as usual will go up. You know? Sorry? Adaptation. Well, you know, this adaptation is... The safety blanket, uh, because human beings have always adapted themselves to climate change. We've had cooling, we've had the little ice age, human beings adopt, adapted themselves. 600,000 years ago, we had global warming, human beings adapted themselves. So this adaptation argument, you know, uh, if you take it too far, my problem is, in this country, 
adaptation has been used as an argument to mitigate the mitigation responsibilities. <laughs> To say that India doesn't have to mitigate, India was only to adapt. Well, human beings always adapt, yeah. Human beings always find ways of adapting themselves to climate change, you know, whether it's cooling or whether it's warming. The real challenge is the magnitude of adaptation. And my point is that the more you mitigate, the less you need to adapt. The scale of adaptation is considerably far more than if you are able to mitigate. Okay? Now, let me give you an example. You must have read in the newspapers today. I'll take an example from today's newspaper. One of the newspapers, I think, today or yesterday, had a big news item on some issue that has bothered me for quite some time. In North India, the average temperature in the month of February has gone up by a minimum of 3 to 4 degrees Celsius in the last 50 years. The month of February and March is crucial for wheat yields. And I think some of you may have read this newspaper article about how there has been a decline in wheat yields in Haryana because of the increase in mean temperatures in the crucial month of February. Now, how do you adapt to this? You adapt to this by developing new wheat varieties, right? That could take one year, it could take two years, it could take five years, it could take ten years. But you could also adapt to this by doing something about the mitigation that is causing this increase in mean temperatures in February. So, I think it's false to see adaptation and mitigation as two mutually exclusive options. You will need to adapt. People on the sea coast will have to adapt because sea levels are increasing. They will have to adapt. How will they adapt? By migration, by relocation, by building sea, you know, bio shields like mangroves. Now, we can help that by increasing the volume of mitigation. That's, that's basically the argument. You know? And I think India's position has been that India doesn't need to mitigate. India. All that India needs to do is adapt. And that, to my mind, has been a very weak wicket on which we have yes, please, found yes. ourselves on. Yeah. Hello. I just, thank you for the informative inf information which you gave, but I, out of utter humor, I just want to ask you, who is going to sign the deal in 2015, Minister of Environment and Forest or Minister <laughs> of Yoga? <laughs> so. No, no, no. The government of India will sign. <laughs> whichever the government of India. I think this government has been elected for five years. So, so this, whichever government is there, they will sign the agreement. So, so, um, uh, so considering that energy security is also necessary for food security, and you have not elaborated on that, but it will be great if you can share how carbon intensity of agriculture need to be reduced for carbon emissions in India. That's something which is important to hear about. And second, the, considering the optimism which is seen in energy policy in India on renewables now, and on the opposite, we also see some sort of like environmental norms delusion. So how do you see both of them coming together in the new government's context? No, on, on the renewables question, uh, I have no doubt in my mind that you're going to see a very bold expansion in renewable portfolio in the next 15 to 20 years. It's inevitable. You can't get out of it. Uh, we have the potential. Uh, we will be called upon to do so. Uh, and as I said, today already, solar and wind account for 13% of our capacity. So it's not small. We still have capacity, although the supply is much less because you know it's a variable sort of uh, energy source. So I have no doubt in my mind that in the next 15 to 20 years at least, you will see a very rapid build-up in the renewables portfolio. And that's good. Uh, how much of that renewables portfolio will reduce the pressure on coal? That is the key question. Are you 
if you require 100,000 megawatts of coal, can you do 80,000 megawatts with coal and 20,000 megawatts with renewables? Uh, or will you do 100,000 megawatts of coal and 100,000 megawatts of solar? And those are the choice questions that we have to make. And my, my view, which is what I have tried to explain, is that in the coal sector, you need to make some choices. Because the more coal you use, the more CO2 you put out. The more coal you use, the more SO2 you put out. The more coal you use, the more NOx you put out. And the more coal you mine, the more forests you're going to destroy. So a unconstrained growth in coal is not in India's ecological or public health interest. You know, people don't realize this, but it's a failure of people, of all of us, actually. A nuclear power plant is less polluting than a coal-fired power plant. A coal plant is more polluting than a nuclear power plant. In all calculations of coal and nuclear, this premium is never put on a nuclear power plant. But in our in our mindset, we associate nuclear with hazards and risks, and therefore it always comes at a lower value than a coal-fired power plant. There was a lady in the last but one row wanted to ask. Yes, please. I would end with your question, though there are many hands. I have to respect the time. Um, so one of the things I've given the given the latest IPCC report that now says we have to do something by uh, 2050. In terms of what would deliver, I didn't hear you speak about energy efficiency at all. It's going to deliver certainly faster than nuclear uh, and hopefully reduce the amount of coal expansion. So that was one question. The other was in terms of the resource conflicts, like you pointed out, India has internal reasons for not expanding coal in that manner or possibly according to us, even nuclear. But uh, on that front, you didn't touch upon water as an issue. And uh, given the cluster coal plants uh, that are coming up and the issue of ash, uh, it seems like water scarcity is also going to be an issue for energy policy planning. Well, uh, if you read my first lecture in Chennai, uh, I did discuss the issue of energy efficiency and what the role that energy efficiency can play. Uh, particularly in the transportation sector. Now, we have now, after a long battle, mandatory fuel efficiency standards, which will be applicable from April 1st, 2016, for all passenger cars. Now, if you have fuel efficiency standards, automatically they translate into environmental standards. Uh, so it's not direct CO2, but it's indirect emission standards. So energy efficiency will play a very important role in the design of buildings, uh, in public transport, uh, I mean in the choice of uh, private and public transport, and in industry. So energy efficiency, but let me ca caution you, with all the energy efficiency that you do, you still require to expand energy supply. The notion that you can meet India's energy demand only by energy efficiency is hogwash. If you were to ask me to put a number on it, energy efficiency can meet no more than 10 to 15 percent of the demand. The bulk of the demand has to come from increasing supply. We have to increase supply. We can inc improve the efficiency of supply. I mean, there's no reason why a coal-fired plant should have an efficiency 35 percent, 36 percent. You have coal-fired plants with efficiency now of 45, 46 percent. So, yeah, efficiency in whatever we do, whether it's in mining or whether it's in pr production, very, very important. Uh, what's your other question? Sorry, the first one. Water, water. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what? Look, I mean, there are many things I didn't talk about. Certainly, water is one very, very big issue. You know, uh, and uh, the availability of water for coal-fired plants. In fact, many of, our coal, many of our power plants now are being located in coastal areas. Look at our nuclear power plants. Some of our nuclear power plants are located in coastal areas. Some of more, many of our future generation coal-based plants are located in uh, coastal areas. And the reason is water and water availability. Uh, and uh, therefore, issues of water recycling, 
uh, become absolutely essential. Water is going to be a severe binding constraint on the expansion of energy supply. Done? Yeah, last question. The last question. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Uh, I don't think I can put it in more sugar-coated way, but then don't you think it's all a sham? Because we sit here in a room that has wooden panelings all around, that's fully air-conditioned. In another 10 minutes, we're going to zoom off in our cars, maybe one or two passengers each. All of us here very well know that the need of the hour is to invest in non-conventional energy sources and try to make them more economically viable. So, don't you think we should invest more in education, in R&D, strengthen those points, and, um, and invest more in public transport, get I rid agree. of Lakshmi Darshan and all such stuff? I can't disagree stuff. with you. I can't disagree with you. So How are you going home? <laughs> I'm, I came by bus. I walked all the way from <laughs> ISC. Go, go so, you are an example of a low-carbon footprint individual. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I don't disagree with you. But, is this room air-conditioned? Yes, yeah? so it's it too chill here. But you can improve the efficiency of air conditioning very significantly. That's where energy efficiency exactly. plays a very important role. So, so I'll give you an example yes, sir. So of we try you know, how you can do this. If you go to the new office of the Ministry of Environment and Forests in New Delhi, you will find that building, India's greenest building today, that building, 200,000 square feet, would have consumed 1,000 tons of air conditioner had it been designed conventionally. It uses 500 tons for air, condition, air conditioning load. And the reason is if geothermal energy has been used to cool the entire building. Yes, sir. Uh, so, you know, you can. there are two ways to say no air conditioners, which is the Stalinist way. Stalinist way was air conditioners for me and for the others no air conditioners. <laughs> so that's one option uh, which we can do without air conditioning. But today more and more people are demanding air conditioners, people wanting refrigerators, people wanting these devices. So the question is how do you meet it in the most energy efficient manner possible? Yes, sir. So don't that's you think, the issue. Sir, don't think you think the government is not doing enough to promote innovations in technology? So no, that it, 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 it makes... has to do more but yeah. today you have star rating. You have star rating for heaters, star rating for refrigerators. You have star rating for air conditioners. And government is telling you, so the Bureau of Energy to, Efficiency is telling you what to buy and what not. I mean, not telling you what to buy, but recommending to you what to buy and what not to buy. But certainly, more requires to be done in terms of designing uh, better devices, better products which consume less electricity. and. There is no substitute for turning off the light when you leave the room. Uh, there is no substitute for a uh, certain degree of austerity when it comes to consumption, particularly amongst our classes who are the consumer risk class. You know, we can certainly do with less consumption. There's no doubt about it. Thank you, Mr. Jairam Ramesh. Uh, we owe you a big applause and thank you. The audience deserves even bigger applause because the discussion was very meaningful. Ms. Jairam Ramesh, I have three things to offer to you. I think it's a good time to remember Buddha. Lord Buddha, teacher Buddha, he said, you are what you think. That is why Buddha migrated to Japan and Korea because they are what they think. I think a lot, in spite of a tremendous thinking and knowledge base, our actions have fallen short of our policies and our thought process. I think unless we correct it, we have a less opportunity to be successful. Second thing, the nuclear energy is a very credible and I would say even inevitable option. But we need to tighten, I fully resonate with you, that it needs to tighten. If we are 5,000 only and don't become 50,000 in the next 10 years, we lose our relevance. How to do it? We must find a way. Second thing I've seen in 40 years, I've been a student of energy research and technology for almost five decades. There is no good technology foresight on energy. Today, energy, food, and water are interlinked. Unless we do a foresight which includes society, equity, progress, sustainability, I think we'd be talking, and they are interrelated things. I believe it's high time 
that we do a good technology foresight which become the agenda for the nation. And thank you very much once again. It has been a wonderful evening. And thanks to the audience. And request uh, Professor Ahuja to give a vote of thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, it's my pleasant duty to propose a vote of thanks. Please allow me to do it in the reverse order of what is generally followed. Uh, let me thank the audience first for coming, for its interest, its attentiveness, its receptivity, and its civility. Uh, the Department of Science and Technology of the Government of India for sponsoring the annual training program on energy security and management under the aegis of which this evening's public lecture was held. Uh, the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy for co-sponsoring today's public lecture. Uh, this is the first time uh, Nias and the Hindu have collaborated on hosting an event, and hopefully this will be the first of a long and a fruitful series. Uh, I thank Mr. Samandan, uh, the Chief Administrative Officer of the Center, Ms. Mandira Modi, and Mr. Saptarshi Bhattacharya for their involvement in the planning for this talk. Uh, before I proceed, I would like to tell the lady who asked the question that we do have a 100 kilowatt rooftop system on NIAS. Uh, it does not pr produce electricity for air conditioning this auditorium, but everything else on our campus during the day is produced by uh, the 100 kilowatt system. We export to the grid and import in the evening when we need this auditorium. Next, I would like to thank Dr. Baldev Raj, the director of NIAS, for so ably chairing the session and moderating the discussion. Finally, anything I would say <coughs> would be in inadequate to do justice to the public intellectual that Mr. Jairam Ramesh is. He was at his usual disarming self. Uh, if you all remember, it was he who convinced President of the US, Barack Obama, in Copenhagen to give up on the dysfunctional command and control system and support the pledge and review system in its place. Or that is what Hillary Clinton tells us. We are also happy that he's in the Rajya Sabha and in the opposition and does not suffer from the bandwagon syndrome and has not yet caught thoroughitis. <laughs> we, we look forward to him for defending the existing environmental laws in the country. We, he is our night watchman and we wish him a very long innings. Thank you.